Today we are looking at John, the lesson, the vision of risen Christ, Revelation 1, verses 9 through 20. Now, one wouldn't think that in, in 11 small little verses there could be that much material. Oh, yes, there is. So, before we begin, let's actually start with prayer. We get all about heads. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, we come to you on the Sabbath day, Lord, this day that you have blessed and sanctified. We ask and pray for your Holy Spirit to dwell among us, Lord, to dwell in us, in our hearts and our minds, that we may have discernment, that we may have wisdom from the living God. And Lord, as we reveal your word, and that's what revelation means, the unveiling of Jesus Christ, and we learn more about your Son, our Savior. We pray, Lord, that you might impress on our hearts and minds the lessons you want us to learn. And you might impress on us, Lord, that Christ is the answer to every problem that we have. And, Lord, that we might have the discernment and understanding to not only know it, but to practice it in our lives each and every day, Lord. That slowly but surely by beholding, we might be transformed more into your likeness to the sons and daughters of the living God. We thank you and praise your glorious name, Father in heaven, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen, Lord. Amen. Okay, we have Revelation 1, verses 9 through 20. And does anyone have the book? Yeah. Would someone like to volunteer to read in their projector? How many pages? Oh, no, no, it's just, um, just, no, the very, no, just the scriptures. Okay. Yes, if you like. Okay. Do you want me to use that or the book? Oh, you can go with the book. Okay. All right. Verse nine. I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the affliction and kingdom and endurance in Jesus. Was on the island of Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Verse 10. I was in the spirit in the Lord's day and heard behind me a loud voice as a trumpet saying, Write down what you see in the scrolls and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamon and to Thyatira and Sardis. And Philadelphia and the Laodicea. Verse 12. And I heard to see the voice that was speaking with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the lampstands, I saw one like a son of man clothed in a robe, reaching down to the feet and girded with a golden girdle. His head and hair were white as white wool as snow, and his eyes was as flame of fire, and his feet were like burnished bronze as refined in a furnace, and his voice was like the sound of many waters, and he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth proceeded a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shining in its power. Verse 17, and when I saw him, I fell at his feet as a dead person. And he placed his right hand on me, saying, Stop being afraid. I am the first and the last, and the living one. And I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever. And I have the keys of death and Hades. Write therefore the things which you saw, namely, the things which are in the things which are about to take place after these things. Verse 20. With regard to the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. Thank you. 
So the section begins with John saying that he's on Patmos because he's a faithful witness to the gospel. And that was in verse 9. We know from writings in history of Pliny the Younger. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's been in Sabbath school before. He was a Roman governor. But um, he writes of the island Patmos as being a penal colony. And some of those islands that are around in that general vicinity, they're the small islands. Um, two centuries later, Victorinus of Patau said that Patmos, on Patmos, John was condemned to the labor of the mines. And really, since there's no mine shaft there on the island, it would, could also be translated quarries. The SDA Bible commentary, and that's from the SDA Bible commentary, and the other footnotes in the book stated as well. So what was John doing on Patmos? Our labor. Our labor. So you're in prison, you get shackles, you're out and breaking rocks or whatever it may be in the quarry during the day. If you're a little slow, what do you get? Probably the lash or a beating. And then you come back and you lie down on some nice rock at night and you go to bed. Sounds like a life, huh? So, particularly for an old man. Right. Who's well into, he's about 90 by that time. Exactly. Mm -hmm. So, crazy. yeah. And God used him. Yeah. Just like move. So, in the lesson states that the hearts on suffered was marked by perpetual fetters. So, he's always shackled. Um, scanty clothing, and if you've ever been to Patmos, it can get cold. Yes. Um, insufficient food, so he goes hungry many a day, if not every day. Sleep on the bare ground in a dark prison, and work under the lash of military overseers. So, and if you look at Patmos, um, if you've ever seen where the traditional spot is, where he had the vision, the dungeon isn't a dungeon. They pretty much throw you in a cave, and they just guard the entrance. So that's your prison. If you try and get out, they have a door. If you try and get out, they can kill you. So Is this John that one right in the uh, boiling oil? Yes, tradition holds that he was, and we get to that later in the lesson, tradition holds that they tried to kill him, boiling him in oil. Oh, no. It didn't quite work. So what do you do with some troublemaking Christian who keeps preaching Jesus, and you can't kill him? You send him to Patmos. At least he's out of the way there, and he can suffer for a long time. So, so where is Patmos? You all should have a map. And if you look, you'll see the seven churches and the red dots here. But if you look right down here, and that spot, you'll see a little black text there that says yeah, Patmos. Patmos. Mm -hmm. So according to the scale, it's about 50 miles out in the ocean, away from Ephesus. And the sea is not pleasant. So even if you remember like Alcatraz, for instance, they used to put people there because nobody could escape. If you actually try swimming away, you die. Kind of the same scenario. So that was a good place to get rid of people. Yeah. Um, and we see that on the map. It, it is a good 50 miles. There are some smaller islands around there. And Pliny apparently wrote that on those were used as penal colonies as well. And if you've ever seen Patmos, you know that it's very steep into the ocean. Kind of like Catalina a little bit, but it's much higher. It's a mountainous, right. steep island. So that's where some of the imagery that we'll see later comes from as well. Because when Jesus gave him the vision, he not only thought of the churches and the people to come, thought about John. So John's kind of on skid row, but we're going to get there. So... The tribulation that John endured was because he was a faithful witness for the gospel, and it became a precursor to all of God's faithful people who experienced hostility throughout the world's history, and especially at the great tribulation at the end. Because if you've looked red plain revelation before, you know that the remnant that's available at the very end is 
will literally go through the closest thing that Christ went through for tribulation. Mm -hmm. So, and verse, Revelation 7, 14 says, I said to him, my Lord, you know, he said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation and they have washed their robes and made them white with the blood of the lamb. So before we actually dive into the rest of this, Victor touched upon it a little bit yes, last week. Um, do you know the significance of seven in Revelation? Completion. Perfection right. and completion. And so you, there's a few sevens in Revelation, right? Do you know how many sevens? So when you said last week that Revelation is where everything ends, right? Oh, you aren't kidding. It is the completion and perfection. So there's seven churches, right? There's seven spirits, seven candlesticks. Seven stars, seven lamps of fire, a book with seven seals, seven horns, seven eyes of the lamb, seven angels with seven trumpets, seven thunders, a dragon with seven heads and seven crowns, a beast with seven heads, that's chapter 13, one, seven angels, having seven vials containing the seven last plagues. The, be um, yep, the beast with seven heads, which is also said to be seven mountains and seven kings. This repeated use of sevens is all symbolic, right? I mean, okay. it is symbolic, but it shows just how complete Revelation is the entire book has the finality of it all etched into it symbolically as well. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you remember in Revelation where it remember or it mentions about the islands disappearing? Oh, no. you said the finality of it all. Oh. What is the it? The great controversy, sin. All of this mess we currently and endure. that started in heaven. It did. Yes, it did. And unfortunately, it's it still down earth. over to the earth. Yes. So, right. and unfortunately, Adam did not have the fortitude. So, we are all made in a broken mold. But there's a fix for that. And who's the fix? Right. Yeah. Exactly. Who's Revelation about? Right. right. Exactly. And who's our only hope? Right. Exactly. Yes. I like that. <laughs> so in Revelation 6 14, it talks and it says, Ah, look at her. Wow. <laughs> Uh, all right, so Revelation 6 14 says, The sky split apart like a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. And Revelation 16 20 says, And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. Now we know when that is, right? At the very end. Right. Right. So, but we also, um, what do you think John thought about islands? Exactly, especially mountainous islands that are penal colonies. And so, do you think he enjoyed the fact that it, they weren't going to exist anymore? And I'll tell you, it's not just for the seven churches, as we talked about. John has been at Patmos, we don't know for how long, right? right. But he's underfed, he's underclothed, he's overworked. Do you think they're trying to break him? Do you think he ever has doubts? So, so and then, you know, finally, Colin, that he was in, and was just usually criminals. Yeah. But he, he was a criminal of, of, of Christianity. Okay. Yes. 
Yes, because Roman, I mean, it was very easy during Roman days, um, even to get a Christian. All you had to do is accuse somebody of being a Christian. And if they wouldn't offer incense to the emperor, they're done. So it was very easy. And he preaching the gospel. Oh, boy, that's trouble. So we see the um, next, the prominence of the ocean and the water imagery. And how many times do you think, if you're right ahead, how many times does it refer to the ocean in Revelation? The sea or the water imagery? Many, many times. 26 to be precise. Oh, oh, I forgot. In one way or another. And it starts off good, but then it takes a turn. So, Revelation 1.15 says, His feet were like burnished bronze. And it has been made to glow in the furnace. And his voice was like the sound of many waters. Okay. Now, we're going to come back to this. But you notice in Revelation, a lot of times it says his feet were light, burning bronze. Or in Revelation 14, too, I heard a voice from heaven like the sound of many waters and like the sound of loud thunder. And the voice which I heard was like the harp or the sound of purpose playing on their hearts. What does John use like? So, so signifies like something. Okay, another language is symbolic. No, actually, on this one, I'm trying to actually describe something to you that you've yeah. never seen before, but I can't find the words for it. So it, it's kind of like this. It's kind of like that. So I, right. You notice in, in the beginning when it says his head, um, his head and hair were white as wool, as snow. So he's trying to press anything he can to depict it, but he's still having the trouble. But this is Christ, and he was with Christ for three and a half years, and he was one of the closest. I know to Christ. But, but this is a glorified <clears throat> and so it's a little different than the Jesus he was with for three and a half years closer to the resurrected Christ who just appears in rooms right but in a sense to heaven but this is now the full blown God and we're going to see that even when he describes him it's still, it's more like the Ancient of Days and Daniel and things like that. Words kind of escape how to properly describe God. So when he's, when Jesus on earth, he's a man. He's like a man like us, class. But when John saw him, it was like God. He was God. Yeah, he's glorified he's more. Glorified. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. So, right, and so because... Even Paul, remember when Paul talks about when he went to the third heaven? And what does he say? Words cannot describe what I saw. There's no, I think Ellen White says that as well, there's no words in the human language to properly convey or describe it. So, yeah, something even in Revelation 4, 6, we're going to see this water thing. And before the, th and before the throne, there was something like a sea of glass like crystal, and in the center and around the throne, four living creatures full of eyes in front and behind. We see that water theme still continue, right? And in Revelation 15, 2, and I saw something like a sea of glass mixed with fire, and those who had been victorious over the beast and his image and the number of his name standing on the sea of glass holding parts of God. Now, the author of Plain Love Revelation likes to compare this to, have you ever seen sunrise where the ocean's kind of flat, but there's that little bit of ripple in the water and how the sun sparkles and dances on it? Almost something like that. But I'll tell you, it's not just imagery, because have we ever seen anything like this before? Remember, he talked about the first place you go to is the Old Testament, right? Well, in the Old Testament, and actually this verse I'll have to bring up real fast, because I do... Not have it here, but in Exodus 24, 8 through 10. In Exodus, that's the way you have the Yes. 
So Moses took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant which the Lord has with you and according to it all these words. Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel, and under his feet there appeared to be, uh, be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Oh, yeah, the King James Version. Sorry, I'm going to... So, but bottom line, you can almost picture that smooth surface with the sparkling or things like that. There's many different descriptions from it for it, but you know what? We're only going to know what it really looks like if we go to heaven. So, but we can see, you know, the John from John's point of view, he's looking at this and he sees the ocean also as a barrier, right? He's 50 miles from Ephesus. And he actually was kind of a um, helped all the churches, was a leader for all the churches and ministered to them and things like that, kind of like Paul did with the churches as well. So he's 50 miles away. There's a turbulent sea that separates him from the people that he knows and loves. And the sea is rough. So what does that sea symbolize? Now the ocean's turning a little uglier. People. Last night, last night, Separation. So, do you think who put him in prison there? The Roman. Maybe it represents the government. Maybe it represents the pagan ideology. Um, and the powers that I, I actually put the powers of the air because who's really running their show anyway? Right. right. Who's really against the gospel being spread with all of his might? Yes. Yeah. Horrible. So, remember, the woman got away, right? So the dragon went to make war with their offspring. And so we see the water take another turn. Revelation 13, 1. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. Then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems. And on his head, heads were blasphemous names. So who's that beast? The sea beast, right? Yeah. Like the papacy. Right? Yeah. What did he do to God's people for 1260 years? Exactly. And the Revelation 17 8, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up out of the abyss and go to destruction. Now you're going to see this a lot. Do you think the devil likes to impersonate God? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Remember the one that was and then died and then lives forevermore? And the beast kind of actually simulates that as well, or, or how should I put it? He tries <clears throat> he, he copies it, yeah. He loves doing that. Um and the best to go to destruction. And those who dwell on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will wonder when they see the beast. And that he and or that he was and is not and will come. And that's that verbiage again. So um you have the abode of Satan and his angels kind of linked to the waters, right? In that regard, because they're rising from the seas, from the waters. Um, they talked about the abyss as well, so symbolically. And we know that the waters represent and the earth. Revelation talks about peoples, tongues, etc. Right? right? So who do they serve right now? They serve Satan. They have the same as when we fall into sin, we have the same character. Well, most of the time we don't even need his help. Although he's always willing to lend a hand. So yeah. And so we see that, right? The beast coming out of the water. We see how they oppress God's people. What about the the book says the prostitute the prostitute or harlot who sits on many waters? Yes. What page are you looking for? I am in let's go to Revelation 17 1. I went on doing page 21. 21. Thank you. Page 21. Yeah. Uh, about uh, 
So, so and verse 17, uh, Revelation 17, 1. Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, I will show you the judgment of the great harlot who's on many waters. And her name is? Babylon. Babylon, that's right. And Revelation 17, 15. And he said to me, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, as we discussed earlier. Amen. And we already talked about the character of the world. So there, if you're not with God, that's the thing most people don't realize. If you don't choose him, you've chosen against him. And unfortunately, it's that simple. You're either on board or you're not. What are you on? What? Oh, yeah. Well, oh, you're on your own. You're still with him. So. Maybe this is a little mm -hmm. simplistic. These are the good guys. Those are the bad guys. But there have been millions say they never heard of Christ, but the Holy Spirit changed them. So I think. Right, and actually, God writes His law in your heart. That's right, yeah. and and so I think even in the midst of all of this mess, that are not part of the Christian group, there will be people saved. Definitely, I mean, everyone makes a choice, and I'll tell you. If I use the example, um, mm -hmm. and some of these Amazonian tribes, right, where they've never had contact with the outside world, yet they have words for good, bad, evil, murder. How do they know these things? Exactly. God's already written it there on their hearts. So that's how they know. So I don't know. Uh, maybe yeah. we can't be too hard on everybody else that's not part of the Christian church. That's you what know what? There is going to be plenty of people in heaven that yeah, you will have no idea. And there's going to be plenty of Christians that you thought were on their way. You're like, where are they going? Mm -hmm. Especially, I mean, only God knows. That's why God is the only one who's fit to judge. Because it's not only what you do, it's your motivation. Right. So. The heart. Right. Your motive, yeah, your heart, your motivation. Why are you doing it? Are you doing it out of love? Because you really want to help? Or do you have an ulterior motive? Is it really about me deep, side, deep down inside? And so, am I doing it for selfish reasons? Or do I actually want to please God because I love him. So okay. Um I am going to go here. So we see in Revelation 18 verses 17 through 24. How am I doing on time? I've made it through three pages. I might have to paraphrase this one. There's like 19 pages to go through so um so on this one, it talks about the merchants of the world, right? And remember when the um, when the harlot has been defeated, and they, they basically, all the wealth that they had from it, and that basically that apostate religion, which is the harlot, and all the, um, they mourn over all of that because they've lost all of it. And, but once again, it's an example of, of basically... She sits on those waters, and that great city sits on those waters. And it kind of it starts off well with God, and then it takes a turn for the worse with the beast coming out, with the harlot on many waters and all that. So you can imagine how John would rejoice when he says, no mountains, no sea, right? But does he mean literal? Because it's revelation, right? It's symbolic. What do you think, literal or symbolic? To, to him, to him, as the sea meant separation from his loved ones. So that's really what the sea was. So no sea meant no separation. The, the reality is, is both. It, it is both because sea not only was separation, but sea to John and to you and to me today really means aggression. It means uh, a dishonoring of God. It means being away from God. John felt both a physical and a spiritual 
experience. Right. But I'll say this, and I do agree because in the new heavens and the new earth, the first heaven and first earth that passed away, and there is no longer any sea, but also it represents the, the evil, the evil and the authority and that you know rebellion against God. We know that there's going to be water in the new in, in the new because oh, yeah. what flows we from, don't know what that means. Right. So what flows from the throne of God in New the Jerusalem? Of life, the life. Does it just go three miles downstream and then go to a pump that goes back under the throne of God? <laughs> I doubt it. It has to go somewhere, right? So I'm guessing there's going to be bodies of water. And whether it's a sea or a lake or whatever, it may be actually, you know, the Dead Sea is just a big lake. So, but um, when there will be some bodies of water, one would think in the New Jerusalem, since a river flows from God's throne, I imagine it has to go somewhere. But the whole point was, yes, it's that that oppression, that enemy of God with the sea so um do you think john was concerned about the churches and now when i say asia we're actually talking about turkey modern day turkey it was called asia back then so the seven churches were all in turkey we know that right and so and were there many more churches than just those seven in turkey oh yeah right if you look at Laodicea, right? There's Aeropolis that was just right up the road, about a couple of miles, yeah. and there's another one as well. So, but God well, picked. Just, just oh, we're getting there in a little bit because God has a definite layout. And remember, seven churches, right? What does seven mean again? So it's representing the entire church, right? Just different aspects of it. And you're going to see how Christ's character, how he describes himself in the beginning, actually has a remedy for each one of those ailments. So, um, do you think he's concerned about the churches? You know how Paul wrote so many letters and things like that, right? So, he's worried about the Roman authorities persecuting the Christians. He's worried about division in the churches and the salvation issues that come about from it and literally... The contention that people have over little things. You ever seen church church members get in a fight over something that doesn't matter? Oh, I'm sorry, a disagreement. Yeah, a disagreement. So, um, did false teachings were around during that time? Yeah. Oh, you bet. Um, especially the Nicolaitans. Oh boy, uh, and um, and apparently John's authority was coming under attack as well. So John preached the truth, right? What do you do when you want to undermine someone and introduce a new teaching? Oh, he got it wrong. No, he didn't know what he was talking about or something. You know, we can play whatever scenario we like into there. But the fact is that um, he was really stressed about that. So he's in prison under hard labor, and he knows the churches are having problems. Oh, boy, that's it's just something. Revelation 111 says... Saying, write in a book what you see and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna, to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Now, these believers initially, you've seen it in other churches, they believed they were on fire for God, right? And as these things progress, you watch their faith get deteriorated. They start doing things they shouldn't be doing or practicing things they shouldn't be. And we'll get into more on that in Revelation later. So literally in Paul, and I mean, in, um, John's on Patmos. Why is he on Patmos, though? Believer, he's a Christian. But why, why did God allow him to go there? There's a mission for it. God has a purpose for him. And you look at, do you think God had a purpose for Daniel when he went to Babylon? Okay. Something similar to that. So he had a purpose. We would not have revelation if he didn't go to Patmos. Okay, there's 50 miles between Patmos and Ephesus. Right. So there's apparently some communication. Uh, in this isolated Patmos about the church. Right. And how, and how would he get something to write on? 
And I, he's, I know. And, and then how is he going to get this 50 miles away and he's on, in prison here? It's, you know, there has to be some means by which he got this. Yeah, sure. I agree. I wonder that myself. And I'm going to have to ask it when I get to heaven. Because, yeah, yeah, but I do yeah. know this. If God wants something to happen, well, I can stop it. So how do you get the paper? How do you get the time to write? Exactly. And all these things. Eventually, that cave is dark. So even while well, was alive, to churches. Yeah, but the guards liked him. The guards actually probably got converted by him. Here, we don't see anything with that. So yeah, but then all the like so I'm sure he had some word about the churches too and the problems they were having as well, which all that weighed on us. Right. And like someone behind me say that you know they probably had supplies coming in on the island. I mean, there right. you know if it's a prison, there's people there that are guards or whatever. So there right. must be something happening. You're not falling back. You know, it's, they were advanced enough, Greece and all that area, they were not, you know, right. you know living in caves. So, they had ships. I mean, even today, there's not a lot of people on the island. I don't know, that one's very small, yeah. but it's not yeah. far. Right. So, right. I mean, most, you know, not very long to get from the like that. Yeah. Right. So, it's just so, so the bottom line, God wanted John and Patmos so that Jesus could okay. unveil himself through him. And I love it because um, we see um, on that barren island, Jesus was present with the people to sustain, sustain them and support them today. Was he with John? <laughs> Even though he didn't feel it at times, right? He was with the churches, right? Then and throughout time, as he with us now. And that's what sometimes we don't, per se, maybe realize. We think, oh, I got this and this. And sometimes we don't turn to Christ. Sometimes we turn to ourselves. Yeah. But we have the answer to everything. So they said, teaching them to observe all that I command you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So even if you feel utterly alone like John did at that point, you still know that Christ is there. Um, we don't know how long he was in Patmos. We know he tried to boil him, to kill him, from traditionally speaking. And so they banished him there. Now, John in Revelation 1.10 says, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. So what's the Lord's day? Sabbath. Is there any other names in the Bible for the Lord's Day? You got to put your thinking caps on. There's two days, two different types of days in the Bible that are referred to as the Lord's Day. Resurrection. So the end, yes, at the end. So we have the seventh. Right. Yeah, the second coming. They said resurrection. It was, you know, okay, first resurrection. Let's clarify, yes. So we have the seven-day Sabbath, and there's a bunch of verses I could read for this, but I'm pretty choir, aren't I? So I'll read one. But as you, um, but as you speak, speak to the sons of Israel, saying, "This is Exodus 31:13. You shall surely observe my Sabbaths, for this is a sign between me and you throughout your generations, that you may know that I am the Lord who sanctifies you." And we have Ezekiel and Isaiah and a whole so even in the New Testament, Matthew 12, 8, for the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. And Mark 2, 28, so the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, there is, and I, I've never pronounced this correctly, it's the, the $20 word that they use in this. <laughs> yes, and I actually wanted to make sure I pronounced it. Eschatological. I had to use Google for that one. So what does that mean? Tell us what it means. It, it, well, I don't, it, it basically means the end, the second coming. But that's what, yeah, I, I was going to say, I, I think the Lord's Day, particularly in this particular definition, that Byron, I know, I know. And you, you want to I'm just going through the book. Right, so the lesson presents both of these, and it does represent the seventh day. Right. But um, just so you know, if somebody tries to argue this with you, 
Um, in Exodus, um, I'm going to actually say in, oh, there's too many about this happening. So um, if you actually go through Joel 2, 11 and 31, the Lord utters his voice before his army. Surely his camp is very great. For strong is he who carries out his word. The day of the Lord is indeed great and very awesome. And who can endure it? So that's the other day of the Lord. Right. At the end, when he comes. But, but, but what I was going to say is that the Sabbath is a representation of total relief and total rescue. Total rescue into God's presence. Every seventh day when we meet in this church, we need to understand that what the Sabbath represents is released from, from, from sin, released from, from the world, and rescued into God. So to say that it represents yeah. the Sabbath is correct, but it is more than just the Sabbath. Right. It is a total restoration to God. And when he uses that, when he uses that, he's actually kind of referencing both. Exactly. Because in the Sabbath, you have kind of that end finalization really pat, and then yeah. if he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, it would have been Sabbath in heaven on earth and with him. And that takes care of which day it was. If Jesus was Lord of the Sabbath. And it's really in the story. Right. We have to be uh, on the and, and the fact we're still here kind of proves it. Right. Mm -hmm. So, right. And that's really what it comes down to. Yeah, I'm reminded that the people who killed Christ were careful <clears throat> to guard the edges of the Lord's day, the Sabbath. That's correct. They were Sabbatarians, paid their time, careful about the diet. They read the Bible, and they were even Advent to small a, expecting a secular. So it's it's very tricky down here. Just by mechan mechanically, is not the right word, but just by by talking about this doesn't mean that, like he was saying, there's a transformed heart. Correct. Right. That's correct. That, that, correct. So, and I want to read this actually from the book, and actually it kind of says both. It is particularly significant that the Sabbath in the Bible has, and wait, where is it? Significance. <laughs> and it's a sign of deliverance, right? So it is a sign of deliverance, just at the end of time when Christ comes to collect those that have died in. Um, it is thus quite possible that John coined the phrase the Lord's Day to combine the two biblical concepts into one. And it tells us readers that he was taken in vision to an eschatological day of the Lord to witness the events during the conclusion of this earth's history. To tell them this vision actually took place on the seventh day Sabbath. This would fit the portrayal of the final events in Revelation, within which the Sabbath, as I will show later, plays a central role in the end time drama. We have a bunch of scripture that we don't need to do. So we're coming to the next section now, Christ as a priest. And that's on page 23, just off the top. So while John was in vision, he said, I was in the spirit of the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like the sound of a trumpet. The voice sounded like a trumpet. A trumpet-like sound in the Bible represents the voice of God. That was the voice that proclaimed the Ten Commandments from Mount Sinai. That's Exodus 19.16. So it came about on the third day when it was morning that there was thunder and lightning flashes and a thick cloud upon the mountain and a very loud trumpet sound so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. Now you hear God when he speaks, right? It either sounds like a trumpet. Sometimes it's like thunder. Sometimes it's just scary. Yeah. Barson, if, if I may, I mean, I don't want to deliberate on this, but, no. yeah, you know, every, every verse of revelation is so full of meaning 
in his own. I know. Yeah. We can't do this one chapter in a day, really. So I'm not sure. They came to the angel on behalf of Jesus and God. Here's to John on God's day to provide marvelous news. Right? That's it. We have to understand that that choice of the day is commensurate with the fact that he was providing incredible news to the churches. Who are the churches? The, the church member. Right. Throughout, throughout the world. Right. This is an incredible picture of who God is and how, how incredible he is to, to really give me a letter of good news to encourage me to be faithful to the end. Right. And it, it all comes back to him. Yeah. That's the beauty of it. Um, so we hear the announce, um, let me go through it. another example, Matthew 24, 31, and he will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and they will gather together his elect from the four winds and from one end of the sky to the other. And there's plenty of other verses in here that actually refer to, um, God sounding like a trumpet. And we know actually the most famous one, at least so we can come to mind, First Thessalonians 4, 16, with the voice of an archangel, um, with the trumpet of God, the dead will rise in Christ first. So God's deep desire to take care of that church in Asia is coming to pass because Christ not only wants him to come for him, he wants him to write to these churches. And do you think John knew Jesus' voice? Now remember, this is the glorified God. This isn't the John, the Jesus that he rested his bosom on. Yes. It says that if you have the mark of God, if you're on God's side, you will be able to recognize his voice. Oh, you're the so, shepherd, right? Yeah, no matter when, no matter when. Yeah. That's good. And so he knew him for three and a half years, right? Spent time with him. And so just by the reference that he used this, then I turn in Revelation 1, 12, and 13, then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me, and having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the middle of the lampstands, I saw one like the Son of Man. Did he ever use that title when he was with John? Yes. A lot of the time. And so John calls him by that name, one like the Son of Man clothed in a robe, reaching to his feet, and girded across his chest with a golden sash. So before we get to the gold son of man, though, we're going to get that in the next section. The seven golden lampstands, what do they represent? As a mystery of the seven stars, seven stars which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the seven angels, and we know that also even when the dragon, his tail swept a third of the stars, right? And the seven churches. So the seven lampstands are the, are the seven churches. So the lampstands are the churches. Now, what kind of lampstands are they? Is it a menorah? There's seven on there, right? Could be. Could be, but no. So um, and the menorah... We see in 1 Kings 7, 49, the lampstands are five on the right side, five on, on the left point, and the, on the right side and five on the left. In the front of the inner sanctuary of pure gold and the flowers and the lamp and the tongs of gold. But what was the purpose of the lamp in the, in the actual temple? Well, it's, it, it's, a, it's also a light, right? Is it supposed to be a light to bear in the darkness, right? So Isaiah 42, I'll read some of these, um, 6 and 7. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will also hold you by the hand and watch over you. And I will appoint you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the nations, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the dungeon, and those who dwell in darkness from prison. I could read a lot more of these, but so what's the purpose of the light? 
to the God of God. Right, to illuminate the world, right. the God. No, no it, it is significant to know that the lamp stand, stand could only give light if there was oil in it. Right. Well, we're, we're getting back to so, so, what were the seven churches supposed to do? What were the seven churches supposed to do? They each have a lampstand, right? And isn't that seven churches representative of the whole church? What text do we have up there? Uh, oh, no. Isaiah 14, 7. So, we look at that, and as Victor said, Matthew 5, 14 through 16, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So, what is it that we're supposed to do? Be like Christ. Right, and we're supposed to go out and maybe tell people about it, right? Remember in Ephesus, Paul came across 12 people who were, who were baptized with the baptism of John, right? Then two years, how many people knew about Jesus in Asia? Everyone had heard of him. No, no internet, no Google, no cell phones. So, right. In Philippians 2.15, so that you will prove yourselves to be blameless and innocent, children of God, above reproach in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you appear as lights in the world. It's supposed to be a perishing world, right? But now skip that. We did that. So what happens if your light doesn't shine in Revelation? Therefore, remember from where you have fallen, and this is Revelation 2 5. And repent and do the deeds you did at first, or else I am coming to you and I will remove your lampstand out of its place unless you repent. What good are we to God if we don't do what we are made to do? That we are made for reason, right? And it's not to make money and make myself look good, is it? Hope not, because I'm failing miserably. It's 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 to become sons and daughters of God, right? And that blows one's mind, right? Yeah, but so God would actually so, take us so transformed that you right. don't recognize the original. The best That's illustration good point. I have is the. Caterpillar turning into a butterfly. Right, the metamorphosis. It's amazing. Yeah. It? There's no it's absolutely established. Yeah. No. Right. Crawling anymore. It can fly. It says we're a new creature in Christ Jesus. But that old man likes to hang on, huh? Yeah. Yeah. Um the focus here on the scene, though, however, is not the churches. But it's Christ in their midst. He's among the lampstand, right? right? John sees him dressed in a long robe with a girdle around his waist. The Jewish historian Josephus describes the high priest as serving in the, chem uh, in the Jerusalem temple as dressed in a long robe that reaches to his feet with a girded around his waist. Isaiah prophesies about the Messiah's day, saying that righteousness will be the belt about his loins and faithfulness the belt about his waist. And we already know we have a high priest in heaven, but this actually even just elaborates on it more. Yes. And John is the only one who will hear this and who is here. Um, anybody else around him hear the voice or just him? I would not think so. Tradition holds. If you've ever been to Patmos, you see a big crack in the whole cave, right? 
Supposedly there was an earthquake and all this other stuff. I would think if they were any guards, they might have actually hightailed it by the by the first quake. But there's no um, references or anything like that. We don't have any other references. So near as we know, no. But I can't say that for sure. Um, so the job of the priest was to keep the lamps burning brightly in the temple. And Aaron was told that he shall burn fragrant incense on it. And he shall burn it every morning when he trims the lamps. And when Aaron trims the lamps at twilight, he will burn incense. There shall be perpetual incense before the Lord and throughout your generations. But that light also is not allowed to go out ever. So in Revelation 2, 1, the angel of the church in Ephesus writes, the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand and the one um, who walks among the seven golden lampstands says this, does this bring to mind the covenant promise of Israel? In other words, when God said, when he made the covenant with Israel, right? What did he say? I will be God and you shall be my people. And where did they prepare a place for him to dwell? Oh, the temple. Tabernacle. Well, initially the tabernacle, so that he could dwell among them. Right. So when Christ is saying when he walks among the lamps, he wants to dwell with us, just like he did with ancient Israel. He wants to be a, yeah, but the temple shifts now from brick and mortar to the human heart. Right, exactly. And it's not just the church, it's the members of the church, because that's what really makes up the church. So he's saying he's in the middle of us. The only thing that locks him out is if we don't open the door. And that that's the problem. He's never the problem. Fortunately, we're the problem. So and it's that, um, so when he symbolically walks with those lampstands, he's actually trying to have that covenant relationship with us symbolically and speaking of that. And so this is all intended to assure both John and the churches that Christ was with them continually throughout the age, right? Because in Matthew 28, the very end, and lo, I am with you, even to the end of the age, right? So now we are at. Do you think? Do you think it's a replacement of the holy place, most holy, where the Shekinah glory was in the physical temple, and now it's in us? Yeah, because when Christ, when Christ died on the cross, right? We know that the um, dividing between the holy and the most holy place was red, the curtain, right? Exactly. exactly yeah. um, we know that. Um, from reading, I have to um, go back and look at Barbara. What was the book um, where the temple doors were open, where the scapegoat always fell on the left? Was that the mission? No. no, it wasn't the mission. Um, and actually, even the scarlet thread. I think that's it. Um, even the scarlet thread that would turn white when the scapegoat reached the wilderness would stop turning white. It stayed scarlet, indicating that the service has been nothing anymore. Exactly. And so it was really that temple did right. Yes. So there's one in heaven and there's one in us. Yes. So it says here Jesus came to Patmos to provide encouragement to John, as John was the priest to the Asia mind. To the Asia. Oh, he was kind of a leadership, a guy, but I don't think he was a priest so much. John was the pastor. Pastor, okay. Of the church is in Asia. Right. But, um, uh, I'm, I'm thinking priest, uh, like the temple, what you said. Sorry. Just kind of like uh, encourage him because he yeah. knows the problem. Well, yeah, and he does. He gets news. He's he's hitting rock bottom. You're, you're beaten. So, all right. We're going on to page 24, the portrayal of Asa. So in the middle of the lampstand, I saw one like the Son of Man, clothed in a robe reaching at, uh, to his feet and girded across his chest with a golden sash. 
So now we come to the part about the Son of Man. Uh, how many times was Jesus referred to? An awful lot, right? And if you see um, in there, it has Matthew 26, 46. It's really 26, 45 in plain revelation. Then I tell you both. So, um, so basically we have you know, Mark 13, 16. And then we'll see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power. Um, Luke 19, 10. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save the uh, that which was lost. So John knew this. Um, but let me ask you. Even John himself says in Second Peter, he goes, "These aren't cleverly, basically one sixteen through seventeen. These aren't cleverly just um, cleverly devised tales. But basically, he's seen Christ. He was a firsthand witness." So, Jesus revealed himself to John as a old uh, God, God, Old Testament. That's why he, the way he looked, it was like John. So, let me ask you in Daniel, let's go back to Daniel 7. So, do you remember the Ancient of Days? And there was a son of man coming, and he came up to the Ancient of Days, and he was presented before him. And he gave him, uh, and to him was given dominion and, and a kingdom and all these things, right? But let's actually go to um, Daniel 7, 9. I kept looking until thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His vesture was like white snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. The throne was ablaze with flames, and the wheels were a burning fire. So we see this. That it's kind of hard to describe the father as well, isn't it? Yeah. So, but you see the similarities. So the glorified God seems to have the uh, the white hair. They don't mention the eyes of fire, but I want the um, the the legs that are kind of like bronze, almost like really heated bronze and so we could go through a few of these but i'm going to skip them because it talks about in daniel his body was like barrel and his face appeared of lightning and his eyes were like flaming torches as daniel 10 and his arms and his feet like the gleam of polished bronze and the sound of his words like the sound of a tollman so we see all these things in the old testament right what are we told to look at First in Revelation, if we're going to look up things, we look in the Old Testament first. So we see all this in the Old Testament. So John gets it that it's Jesus, right? We know that. It's kind of hard to miss it when you know that John read the Old Testament, or which was the Torah in his time and things like that. So he knew these things. So what does it all mean? Why did Jesus appear like that? Why did he take that form? What is the symbology? Because everything symbolic in Revelation is about, right? What do you think the white hair means? The, the white hair like wool. Wisdom. Yep, Job says both the gray-haired and the aged are among us, older than your father. But Proverbs says, 2.29, the glory of the young men is their strength, and the honor of the old men is their gray hair. So it is a wisdom. What about the flaming eyes? Kind of hard to see with those, right? So the flaming eyes. Revelation 2, 18 and 23. And the angel of the church of Thyatira write, the son of God who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says this. And I will kill her children with pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the minds and hearts. I will give to each one according to your deeds. So those eyes of flame are the piercing eyes that see everything. Do you hide anything from God? Well, he, he, you know, he appears as the exalted God, the exalted Savior. Right? That's at the end of it. 
first and foremost, right? But he's also appearing as the authority of God the Father. You're still in my thunder. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. Uh, so the burnished bronze legs are for stability. And in Ezekiel 1 7, their legs were straight and their feet were like calf's hooves, and they gleamed like burnished bronze. His voice, well, I think we've already established the voice of God, right? Okay, what's the purpose of Jesus referring to John in Patmos? It's the same uh, reason for the seven purposes. Yeah, yeah. They encourage the church to do as well. Can you explain us the purpose of for those things? We're, we're, we're coming there. I'm going faster now because I realize time is dwindling. Um, and then the shining face refers to Jesus' exaltation, right? So his face shone like the sun. And the two way story coming out of his mouth? Mm -hmm. Hebrews 4.12. For exactly. well, the word of God is living and active and sharper than any two-edged sword and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit of both joints and marrow and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. Amen. So Christ in every way appears and acts with the full authority of God. He is God. We know that, but all authority has been placed under him. He has the same authority as the Father because it's, it's been given to him, but he has it. The remaining section goes through in this part of the book about how the Gentiles, um, Jesus invoked the image of Hecate to them and how she was a goddess under many different forms and Honestly, because of time, I'm going to kind of skip that one. Um, we are in page 25. Um, the second paragraph, when it talks about the Old Testament, how the Jews would get in with Jesus, but however, the Gentiles um, couldn't, so they invoked the image of the, the Hellenistic goddess Hecate, who took many different names and had the keys to kingdoms and all this. And by this, it actually um, shows that Christ had a higher authority than her. I really didn't dwell into that too much because there's much better stuff to get to. Um, which is actually when I go to the words of encouragement to John, which is on page 25 towards the bottom. Right. Because we only have about 30 minutes left. So, as we discussed earlier, Jesus came to Patmos to encourage John, right? Well, let me ask you, when people encounter God, when he meets them, even in vision, what usually happens to them? They're scared. They're scared. Well, remember Isaiah? When he saw God on his throne, woe is me. Yeah. Right? So uh, we see Daniel, when he falls and collapses like a dead man, right? right. John kind of does the same. Which brings me to the point, when people say fear of the Lord... Right? The people are like, oh, you're afraid. This is that fear of the Lord, where it's so awesome to be in his presence, you just don't know what to do. I mean, you literally, they fall like a dead man, or they think they're doomed because you look at us compared to God, you're like, I don't even belong here. I don't. And so that's where it really comes into play, that word. You're awestruck, you're overwhelmed, and you are afraid. So, and Matthew 17, 6 through 7, when on the on the Mount of Transfiguration, um, when the disciples heard this, when God speaks, right? They fell down on the ground and were terrified. And Jesus came to them and touched them and said, Get up and do not be afraid. Christ doesn't want to see us afraid, but we're on so different levels, it's hard for us not to be afraid. When he's in, when you're in his presence. There are two. Uh, there are different categories of afraid. You know, you're afraid of. It's not afraid. I'm scared, but I'm afraid uh, when I fear God. I don't want to do any sin because I'm fear God, right? What is it being fear of God? Well, I think there's also the fear of being separated from God. 
Uh, no, God no, fear is no. me fear because I feel like I'm very sick. I'm sick. I'm not worried. I can't face it. That I can't. I'm gonna die if I do. Like that kind of fear. Or when God is not in present in, in my on my face, I fear God. I don't want to harm anybody. I don't want to do any sin because I'm 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 a God fear. But you do. Uh, right, you still do it on the love. It's not, oh, God's going to whack me if I don't do this right. So we all get this. So, all right. Take uh, the power to be in uh, His presence uh, and to be a sinner, and you cannot sin the vices of uh, right. the Lord. And that uh, His power flows to us, and we are just. That word fears is not exactly right. And, and, and they're afraid they're not thinking that God's gonna kill them or beat them up, right? That just like being in the presence of him and the state that we're in, it's it's a normal reaction. So John and he told him in Revelation 117, when I saw him, I fell like a dead man and he placed his right hand on me saying do not be afraid i am the first and the last you know john had heard those words before and immediately jesus spoke to him saying in matthew 14 27 take courage and do not be afraid and in another verse 17 7 in matthew get up and do not be afraid so we see all these examples of Jesus calling his disciples not to be afraid, right? If you walk with God and you realize who he is and we can do that surrender, are we supposed to be afraid of the second coming? No. no. Do you know people in the Adventist church who are? Yeah. So, yeah, but it's even, even those who are supposed to know, right? So it's not about being afraid of God. It's not, oh, I've done this or that. It's not the checklist. It's about building that relationship with them. Exactly. Not, it's not a collection of information. Right. So it's not an intellectual knowledge. It's not heart knowledge. Yeah, right. absolutely. Right. Yeah. Patricia? My joke said, though you slay me, Lord, yet will I trust. Will we think that God is supposed to have one of the people who split the Right. Job knew that God had some other intention, whatever the devastation he was. And he lost everything his family, his children, and yet he drew them. Right. So. We see him encouraging, and we have a whole slew of other Bible verses here that I am going to skip. So let me ask you the character of God. He wants us to come to him. He wants us to be with him, right? Has he ever changed? No. So since the beginning of creation, right, he, he came down out of heaven and went through everything he did because he loves us. Yes. And so, and you but, know, yeah, you say everything. He was bullied as a kid, right? Out. It, 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 it attacked verbally, snide, all of the stuff that we read about that happens was aimed at him as a kid, and growing up, it had to be because he's perfect and they hate perfection, right? He was a man of sorrows. Yeah, that's right. Absolutely. Right. It was not an easy life. No. 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 Any one of us would have buckled. Yes. That's right. How is the spiritual submission of the seven churches back then? Why did Jesus come and reveal it to uh, encourage to John? Oh, we are going there right now to the encouragement of the churches. So, but would Jesus claim that victory, right? What did he, and it said, I am the living one. I was dead and behold, I live forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. What do the keys symbolize in um, in Revelation? Well, that, that's power. That's, that's uh, authority of power. So, 
I'm in charge. Right. And basically, so by saying that he has the keys of death and Hades, he's saying there's nothing that I don't have control over. There's nothing that I am not over. Barbara, you, you made the statement just before you go into some encouragement for the church. You made the statement that I, I really appreciate immensely you asking the question. And there was a question. So when Jesus comes, how, how am I going to feel? How am I going to react to his coming? His coming is not only his appearing, but the earth is trembling. The earth is falling apart. How do I feel? And that's the condition of the heart. If I really have despised the world, his coming is a marvelous occasion. I couldn't care less about which building is being is being destroyed or how the world is failing. His coming is a solution for my life. Right. That's a condition of the heart. It is. If I am attached to the world and I begin to see the world kindly, his coming isn't a pleasure. You're going to be Lot's wife. Exactly. And that is a significant, a significant spiritual condition of the churches then, of the church today, which means of Christians and Christians. Right. Yeah, it says that uh, the church back then was backsliding. That's why he said he's feeling to John to write to the churches. Some more than others. So, an encouragement of the churches. Let's go there now. Page 26. So, John had been encouraged, right? It was time to encourage those churches. And so that John can put his worries at ease as well. Because he's finally going to get a letter where he knows Christ is involved. So, Jesus has a message for the second seven churches, and he's enlisted John to be his God breathed instrument. He knew that the Ephesians were backsliding in love. He knew that the Sumerians were suffering with the constant fear of what the future would bring. He knew the circumstances of the Christians in Pergamum and that um, Thyatira was divided. The spiritual complacency of the Christians in Sardis, the spiritual weakness of the Philadelphians, and the self-sufficiency and blindness of the Laodiceans. He knew all these things. Since Jesus knows the problem that each of the church faces, he also knows the solution, just what they need, right? And it is all intro um it's all the intro to christ's initial introduction the church of ephesus he comes as the one who holds the seven stars in his right hand what's in the midst of the seven golden lampstands for i'm going to skip that for um the church of Pergamum, he comes as the one who has the sharp two-edged sword that knows the truth right what does it mean to a sharp? Divines between bow and arrow. In other words, it sees and knows the truth of why you really do things, what your motivation is. The third church in Thyatira, he comes as the Son of God, the one whose eyes are a flame of fire and his feet like burnished bronze. In other words, he sees exactly what's going on. I can't hide anything from him. And he stands firm with those feet of bronze. The um, Church of Philadelphia, he comes as the Holy One, the one or the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one shuts and shuts and no one opens. He has total authority and power. This is over um, Philadelphia. These are all things, solutions that these churches need for their particular problem. And they're all actually mentioned in Revelation. And then the church of Ephesus, which is losing its first love and is threatened by false teachers. Jesus comes as the one who holds their situation in his hand and who walks in their midst. The church of Smyrna goes through dire persecution. Jesus suitably presents himself as the one who has 
also experience what they're going through. He gives them a promise of the resurrection, and he makes similar promises and presentations of himself to the rest of the churches. So it's like in um in the Smyrna, right? They're being persecuted. That was actually um represented by the Diocletian, I believe. The, the heavy persecution for 10 years. He goes, even if you die, you will have a resurrection. So their fears, he's giving them the answer to their fears. And all of these, um, we see that each church gets a part of the picture, right? But remember, nobody gets the whole picture. What do the seven churches represent? The whole church. Exactly. And, and, and I think, Byron, I'm so glad that you, you, you're handling this because it is important for us to understand. These were actually characteristic of seven churches at the time. Right. But it also represents seven periods in the, in, 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 in the time of Jesus' ascension to Jesus' second coming, seven, seven right. periods, periods that will characterize God's church. And thirdly, it represents my condition. Right. I can be Ephesus today, but I may be Sardis tomorrow. Even back then, yeah. you could be Ephesus. Absolutely. Or Sardis. Absolutely. So it represents my condition. And, and this matters for me as much as it is for anybody during this period of Christ's ascension until, until Christ's second coming. Mm -hmm. And I need to understand what is my condition. And those am I an Albany say Right. Am I a Philadelphia? Am I a Sardis? I don't want to go too far down that road because I'd be stealing Barbara's thunder. Oh, I don't. Oh, no, no. Um, that, no thing is, but the whole thing is um, those seven issues that the church has had, right? Yes. Are ch issues for the whole church. That's right. For every single one of them, including us now. Yes. Yes. Yeah, I mean, it, you know. I think you know, Delta was the only one that didn't have anything. Or maybe you know, it was like, oh, no, no, we're getting right Hold on. Philadelphia was second to worse. Oh, yeah, second worse is right. Is there any significant that God appeared to the we're, we're gonna no it's so he talks about the characteristics right so like this church is, gets this to fix their problem this church gets this but once again that's for the whole church so everything that he's telling you each of the old church is something that should apply to each and every one of us when he appeared to Philadelphia, like, he appears like uh what he appears like uh, but is there any significance why he differently? Because it's um for their problems that they're experiencing. Correct. Right. Yes. That's why right. right. so, the meaning of each church is the spiritual uh, right. condition. And the appears to them is the remedy for that condition. So even though I might be in Ephesus, I might have a Laodicean problem. Correct. He still has the cure for me because remember. This letter of Revelation is read at every church. That's right. It's not just read at Laodicea. So they read all of it right. at every church because they know right. every church needs to hear it all. Right. So when he appears to Teatira, it's son of God. Is that means what? Like a flame fire. Barbara is going to unpack that. So you right. Next, next week, exactly. we have a handout for all of you. Yeah. That some of you have seen before, but it's really a matrix of the seven churches. Right. Okay. So, so we'll be giving you that next week. Back. We're going to be going church by church over the week. Well, and why do they break it up in sections like that? Well, let me ask you this: How many gospels are there in the Bible? Four, five, 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 five. Four plus one, right? Okay, so let's stick with the four at the moment, okay? So, do they all tell the exact same story? Word for word? 
Do they have the same meaning? Though? Variations. Yes. Yeah. Variations. What does, if one book has something, say Mark has something that Luke does it, does that give you a fuller picture? Yes. And that is exactly what this is doing with the seven churches, is trying to give you the full picture. It breaks it down, but it still applies to all. Amen. And so, as we already talked about, you see, I write all this stuff down, but we jumped the gun a lot. But so we know the seven churches are all the problems of the church, and Christ is the only solution. So if you focus on Jesus when your troubles arrive, you're already getting the answer and help that you need. And it is that simple. You mean it's one-stop shopping? Yes. <laughs> As sin increases, grace abounds. We are yeah. finally to the last that section. What? Oh, boy, if I sin more, I'm going to get more grace. Oh, shame on you. But then those piercing eyes are going to see your motivation, and that's going to be trouble. So, okay, so as sin increases, grace abounds. All seven of the messages begin alike. They also conclude alike. Each concludes with a personal appeal. The one who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And that's Revelation 2, 7. Every member of each church is urged to heed the messages. Because what is a church anyway, right? If there's no people, you don't have a church. The church is the people. So if the church heeds, that means the people in the church are listening. And each church has a promise to everyone who overcomes. Each church isn't exactly what Jesus wants them to be. None of them are perfect. Some are worse than others. Ephesus is still faithful, but they're not where they should be. They lost their first love, right? We have Smyrna and Pergamum are generally faithful, but still need encouragement for those that are in doubt. Especially like at Smyrna, we talked about when they, if they do kill you, don't worry, you'll be resurrected, right? Thyatira is divided. Sardis and Philadelphia are in serious trouble. Only a few still represent God correctly in those churches. And Laodicea is the worst. Jesus will vomit them out. Self-sufficient and indifferent, a lukewarm Christian represents God in the worst way. Amen. And I'm throwing this in because you're hot or you're cold. Christ says that, right? right. But if you're lukewarm, mm. you misrepresent God and you lead people away from heaven, right. away from salvation. Well stated. That's the worst kind of Christian in God's eyes. Amen. This one Oh, we're getting there. Wait, we got round two. So, Ephesus, and as, as they get worse, right, the promises increase. This is where the grace abounds with sin. So, Ephesus had one big thing. They lost their first love, right? Correct. And Christ says um, that they will, um, Ephesus gets one promise, that they will obtain the tree of life. And that's in Revelation 2.7. Smyrna is given two promises to have a crown of life and to escape from the second death. So apparently they were a little better than Pergamum, who was given three promises to have hidden manna, to have a white stone, and to be called by a new name. And that's Revelation 2.17. Thyatira is given four promises to have the authority over nations, to rule over the nations with an iron scepter, to dash the nations into pieces, and to be given the morning star. And that's Revelation 2, 26 through 28. Sardis is given five promises, to walk with Jesus and to be dressed in white robes, to have their names not blotted out of the book of life, to be acknowledged before the Father, and to be acknowledged before the angels. And that's Revelation 3, verses 4 to 5. This, this all in Revelation. 
I'm reading the process. I'm telling you the verses. There's too many people talking. Okay. Okay. What part did you get last? Just keep going. Okay. So, but that was so. Sardis has given um, the um, five promises. Philadelphia has given six promises to be kept from the hour of trial, to be pillars in the temple to never leave the temple and to have the name of God, the name of the city of God and God's new name written on them. And Laodicea, the worst of the worst for the creme de la creme in the negative category. They are only given one promise. Wait a minute, there should be seven, right? But the promise is to sit with Jesus on his throne so if you get that promise you get it all and that's that's the thing so you get that you get everything that promise incorporates all the other promises that were made to the churches to sit with jesus on his throne means you have all these promises you know when it talks about sitting with jesus on his throne you have to realize that later to see the later to see in church is the church that helped Christ fight the final battle. And we're we're the church who's supposed to go out and share the message with the world, which means come out of Babylon, and that's a serious message to be given. Yeah. And so that is why there's a special blessing offered to that group. You know, so is this prophecy? Yeah, read the priest. No, 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 this one, the message uh, to sit with Jesus. Oh, okay. It's Revelation 3 21. Yeah. I keep reading the verses as I say them. It's all scripture. So, Revelation 2 7 says, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Mm -hmm. To him who overcomes, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. We see all of these promises. And actually, I didn't want to read this scripture because we don't have time. But all of this scripture, unfortunately, and you do have a copy of the scripture at least. So from Revelation 2.7 to Revelation 3.21 goes with all these promises. So, but since we're at 8.36, um, I'm going to go to, and I read the verses anyway for it, so. As sin increases, grace abounds is the title of this section. We read Romans 5.20, the law came in so that the transgression would increase, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. Paul writes that, right? With each of these of the churches that was, as the decline worsened, the promises increased. And the point that we, uh, at the point where you can sit on the throne with Christ. So you have to be truly that indifferent and overcome that much. You have the most, as the light of the same church, you have the most overcome of any. So you could be Laodicean 300 years ago. You can be Laodicean, Laodicean today. Yep. And Ellen White writes in Selected Messages, the church, enfeebled and defective though it be, is the only object on earth on which Christ bestows his supreme regard. He is constantly watching it with selectitude and is strengthening it by his Holy Spirit. You have the best possible help. You can't buy it with money. You can't buy it with anything. Christ did it all for us out of his love. And he offers it freely. But do we take it? Our only hope is Christ. Ever since we fell in sin, we're daughters. And it's true today. What does Revelation tell us? It's true not only in the beginning. It's true in that 
eschatological, uh, and there, I got it finally. <laughs> Jesus walks among the seven lamps. He walks among the entire church. He walks among you and me. Why don't we open the door? It says, don't be afraid. And remember, we said it earlier, lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Why don't we make that choice to open the door? Barbara is going to go much more into it next week, but at the end, if we're not in the if we're not in the first resurrection, we won't have any excuses. So I know I look at this and I do the study, and even though it stresses me out, and my wife can attest to that, I still look and go, "What do I need to change in my life?" What do we, any of us need to change in our lives? That we can be the sons and daughters of the living God. Yeah, that was yeah. prayer. Yeah, yes. That was so significant. Wonderful. So we yeah. have we, thank you. He does it all. So what do we do? So do you have any questions, anyone? I just want to say to you. Uh, I agree. Go ahead. Yeah, what is it that we're supposed to tell other people? All of this information. I don't mm -hmm. so. No. It's, so it's um, listening in my opinion, listening to other people and have them talk to us and where we say something positive for them. Yeah. Right. And God will open it's, doors. It's not a bad yeah, no, it's not. And I you can't just say, well, this and this and this. And I have I have a few ongoing people I talk to, but God opens doors. And I can talk to somebody for six months and make zero traction, but then one day something will happen and you'll see that opening. Exactly. And God, can, we, who am I? Or any of us. God has this all orchestrated. He knows the beginning to end. He knew the churches back then. He knew us before we were ever even born. He knows every decision I've ever made, even though I have freedom of will, freedom of choice. So hopefully we choose wisely. So, uh, you know, we've studied the churches before and as we're going to go into it. The thing that boggles my mind is how God and Jesus has, even though every church has so many flaws, and he's underlining the flaws, then he has a promise for each one of them. Yeah. the churches. It's like, he's got a resolve, and he is a resolve. And it's like we are they're not lost and neither are we. Right. Because what is revelation about? Right. And, and right. Water, I mean, uh, to to my wife's uh, to my wife's you know statement, we need to understand that who walked among the candles there? Jesus. Right. So here's Jesus walking the my condition, my spiritual condition, 24 7, 365. Right. We have no excuse whatsoever in not having a relationship with God, for He is with me and with you and everybody else right now and 24 7 365. Yeah. Yeah. It's very clear what Jesus gave us to tell the characteristic of the churches, of all churches. Right. The weakness, the good things about the church, and there is a promise, it's our choice. Right. Are we willing to do it? The promise is really good for each church. The only choice that we have to make. So let me ask you have you ever seen division in an STA church? Have you ever seen complacency? Have you ever seen that self sufficiency? Yeah. We might be SDA, but we're all seven. And it depends on who you talk to that day. Oh, just like the church of them, the, this message was for and those, they were God's churches. Right. And, and very important where he's wanting a message given to them and he's walking in their midst. We are in the same condition. We're no right. I, I'm going to go with them probably worse, but. And they like to tell you also if you look at your map and you see the, how it goes through, it's actually all on the postal road, too. So yeah. I don't think that's why Jesus chose them, but still, it's just kind of ironic. You mean the Roman, 
Yes. So what should be the administrative bench on the state? Oh, we have an issue copy. Yeah. Yeah. Can we yeah. be respectful and let one person copy? What should be the oh, average message? Oh, I think there's three of them that fly in midair. Um, I was waiting for some of them. Good point. Okay. Three angels' message. What is that? Oh boy, that's you see more pamphlets and you take it all around to the neighborhood and they throw it out and think they're learning. Yeah, you know, the best example I mean, is... just this has happened. The some churches don't even call themselves Seventh day Adventist churches anymore. Now, you know, the best testimony you can ever give so much evangelism, right? Of, of this kind of thing has turned so many people off. Why so don't people pastor, like Christians? Maybe they don't act like Christ. Or maybe we're not community. Right. But well, I've seen I've only been Adventist for about 16, 17 years. Oh. I've seen everything from I know it all like the Jewish mentality. We have the truth. I don't need to bother with those people. They're lost anyway. I've seen lots of different things within the church. But the best thing we can ever do is emulate the character of Christ so that people yeah. see it. We are that light on the lampstand, not under the basket. And if you do that in Ephesus, when those 12 disciples, they didn't talk bad about the God of the pagan gods, they didn't do any belittling, people saw what they have and said, How can I get how can I be part of that? So if you ask. If I'm brutally honest, a lot of lost their fire. And I actually have my own ignition issues myself, per se. Yeah, I, I won't just still say I'm perfectly flawed. So, because we all are, we all have something. Of course, everybody does. So, my wife can chat up with somebody just like that, me to go up and talk to a stranger. Oh. I think that's why we need to pray for the um, water rain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. so that's the only way we'll be able to preach and live the message out is if we have the Holy Spirit completely transform us. Amen. Right. I actually had some guy when I was in um in Smart and Final about a month ago, and he's talking and complaining about everything. And I'm like, God, this is my sake. I go, he goes, There's no truth in this world. I go, I know the truth. He goes, What is it? I go, the Bible. And he goes, okay, I'll give you that. But then he proceeded to tell me a whole bunch of other stuff with conspiracy theories. And then he said, Trump can get us all out of it. And then I realized that I um, I hit a wall. But it still took me 10 minutes to escape. But um, so, bottom line, God will still, because how do I know you still try? Because how do I know that that guy won't listen? Possibly. So my neighbor who basically I talked to her um her, her husband recently passed away and I tried talking to her finally a little bit about the Bible and things like that and and the state of the dead and things like that. And no, not not try again in six months. So but the whole thing is living it is the best thing you can do. So I hear so many people talk about people at church or one way in church. And then you get them outside of church, and oh boy, it's hard to distinguish them from the world. <laughs> well, there's one thing about Jesus. He care, cares about people. Right. He sure does. I mean, that's the whole Absolutely. that's why he came to earth and died. And, and so, you know, it's just, that's what we've been learning all that. Right. Matters. And the whole thing is he was the same, he never changes. Even when he was in human form, right? He never changed. You know, you know by that was a very, a very good question. That was really a very good question. The problem with us is discipleship is not really a right you because discipleship creates a church of peculiar people. And we have run away from being peculiar. Amen. And the reason we have run away from being peculiar is because we feel uncomfortable when people look at us funny. 
Yeah. Not only that we go to church on the Sabbath, right. but you know, we don't smoke, we don't drink, we don't do this, we don't do that, and we become the people that do not do. Okay. And we run away from that. But God says, I'm building a peculiar people. Right. So what does that mean? Uh, not in my dressing, although that's important. Not in my eating, although that's important. But in my relationship to God. Right. And yep. if my relationship to God is like anybody else's in my neighborhood, I will never be a peculiar people. Yeah. That makes a difference. I've got a neighbor who's an engineer. And when he's talking to another neighbor and I come by, he says, uh, he says to the other neighbor, uh, Yes, the Christian. <laughs> you know, I'm actually, I'm not because they both claim to be Christian. <laughs> but the reality is, I'm identified as a Christian. But the best, one of the best ways to communicate is by who you are, how you live, how you behave, yeah. how much. But I also can tell you, I went to my, oh, I need to be careful because uh, she may be watching. Oh, yeah. I, I, I went somewhere today. Yeah, somewhere. And uh, after I was fixed physically, I sat down and that particular person had heard that I was teaching a Revelation seminar. And we sat for 20 minutes. And for 20 minutes, very place I told her what Revelation was about. Right. And it really starts with this understanding. The Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell us about God and what God did for us on this earth. Yeah. And then God ascends to heaven and the Gospels come to an end. Revelation, which is the fifth Gospel. And for me, a vital gospel where everything comes in. Mm -hmm. The gospel of Revelation tells me what God is doing for me right now in heaven. Mm -hmm. And then it tells me how he's going to fulfill his promise. Mm -hmm. Because when he left the, the, this earth, he told me, I'm going to come for you. And I'm going to build a place with you. And I and everyone else that loves me is going to live with me eternally. Mm -hmm. And then he describes the pathway of that journey. Right. So I said, it's good news. And if you want to know what God's doing for you, and if you want to know how God's going to come, then read it and study it. Because that's today the most one of the most significant gospel that we really need to understand. And 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 so that's part of evangelism. That's what you do. When you sit down and you create an interest in a heart that says, you know, I really want to know more about that. All right. Mm -hmm. And I thought of it. It's actually, you said a peculiar people, right? Yeah. We can either try and be like the world, or you can flip it and say, or I can join an exclusive club. <laughs> <laughs> Although I might not be the yeah. yeah. Because you know, uh, lots, lots of other brothers and sisters think, think that the church is a club on the Sabbath. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, so on that thought, one last question. I'm getting the, we got to go. You know, the reason why Stephen gets stoned because he preached about God and Paul and Paul and all the, uh, the apostles got tortured because they, they preach, they, they speak of the of God. Right. So, for example, Mary said we have to pray for the library so we can speak. Right. Right. For some people, they don't have no problem speak of God. I don't have a problem giving book to people, like walking, go to TJ Maxx, pay my pay my purchase, and they say, "Would you like to have the book? I carry in my bag. I carry in my purse." What I'm saying, if we preach like Paul or Stephen, we're gonna be stoned. We probably gonna be go to jail now. Right. Are we willing to be like them? Because Ellen White wrote, some of us have to be like them. Yeah, do we have that level of commitment? That's a good question. So I remember in last day events, um, she read, 
on the church books at that time, she said not one in or not um one in twenty would be prepared to meet the Lord. And I'm like, that's a high oh, percent like like rate of going to and I'm not going to speculate whether we've gotten better or worse, but you're right. There's a level of commitment. Well, she involved. said there's not one in a hundred that's willing to take off to So, okay. So on that note, maybe it's something to pray for. Yeah. As we wrap up, as I get the, the we got to go. So, oh, yes. Uh, well, the two saying, yeah, that's very correct. And, uh, we have to wake up and no sleeping because without the Holy Spirit and the later rain, which is right now, if we sleeping, we can do nothing and we get lost. A Holy Spirit will be go away from this earth and we don't get it because we are sleeping. Like this uh, ten virgin, right? Five have enough oil, which is Holy Spirit, and right. other didn't have. So, church have to wake up. If we, and we do it everyone. I think what you're trying to say is if we have that relationship, then all these things will flow on naturally. Yeah. But Walking, right. talking with uh, God and everything. And I'll say, yeah, I follow Jesus and who knows where is Jesus far away. I'm Christian, but what kind of Christian? Right. So, walking, talking with Jesus. That is important. If we live in our hearts, uh, we live in Him. What Apostle Paul says, I don't live anymore, but Jesus Christ lives in me. Right. And I live in Him, that means abide with Him. You hold on to Him. Right. And then He gives us strength because we cannot do nothing without Him. Amen. All right, let's pray. Okay. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for the message that you gave so long ago on the island of Patmos, Lord. You gave it to the churches. You gave it to us all. Lord, some way, somewhere, we all fall short. It's a given, especially with our, our carnal flesh. But, Lord, you are there in our midst. Pray, Lord, that we might grab hold of you, that we might cling to you, Lord, and abide in you, that we might have a temple of our bodies fit for a dwelling of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that we may die to self each and every day, that your will, that your ways, and that your, your glory, Lord, might shine through us, that people say, what do they have? That your good pleasure might be done, and Lord, that we might represent you well each and every day. Because Lord, one good representation of you can change a heart. And Lord, it starts even with ours. Because Lord, by beholding, we are transformed. By doing your good pleasure, we are changed as well. Teach us, Lord, to remember it's never been about us, and it never will. Amen. It's all about the love that you have for us. Yeah. It's all about the desire you have to bring your creation home back to you, Lord. Yes. And though we're broken and fallen, Lord, you want to make us that new person. Lord, many of us have been baptized. We've been that new person in Christ. We still are. But Lord, that old man sneaks through sometimes. Teach us, purge us, and guide us that we may have your truth, your discernment, and your knowledge in all that we do, Lord. How we speak, how we act, and how we live our lives. We thank you for your mercy, the gift of your son. Yes. Lord for paying the ultimate price for us. Yes. Help us to truly understand what we cost, that we might realize how precious we are in your eyes, Lord, and that we might turn from whatever little things still may separate us, give ourselves to you wholly. We thank you for the Sabbath, 
for the time to put aside the world and come back to you, Lord. We pray that everyone gets home safely. Lord, we pray that people's hearts might be touched and that your spirit may dwell and work on those areas that need changing for myself and whoever else you are. We pray that you might be shown. We thank you and praise you, our Father in heaven, the Son, our Redeemer, our Helper, the Holy Spirit. And thank you. In Jesus' name we pray, Lord. Amen. Amen. Amen.